my my impetus to really make the change was going back to what I love, and that's being an entrepreneur. So, you know, for me, Ryan, it was kind of like I felt that way, felt valued, felt like I was making a difference, felt less so towards the back end of my career. So when I retired from that world, then, uh, gosh, 2009, um, I was 49. Uh, and my main um, impetus to make the change was to return to my roots of being an entrepreneur. I always had my own landscape business as a kid. Uh, I got involved really? and yeah, yeah. I, I used to cut lawns. I used to uh, take my shirt off and cut lawns up and down the block that I grew up in in Connecticut. And um, that was my deal. And I, I, anything that resembled a small business, I would do. I sold door to door, you know, when the uh, Cub Scouts and Weeblos, I, I did all that stuff. Um, so that's why I made, made the change. And um, I actually tried to retire for about a month and uh, played golf and fished and uh, I was bored out of my mind. Uh, so <laughs> that kind of quickly turned into, you know, hey, what I really want to do is get involved in ventures and businesses. And I, I kind of watched my entrepreneurial friends do startups. I said, that looks like fun. I was always intrigued by M&A because um, I was, in, you know, as, as Chris knows, I uh, wrote checks to a lot of companies that my friends ran uh, and kind of saw it through the lens of board of advisors, board of directors, uh, but didn't really have an operating role. So, so really, when I left uh, corporate world, I kind of thought of myself as a, you know, reformed senior executive <laughs> or an entrepreneur. Uh, and basically said, I'm just going to start a consulting company called the Velarde Group and wrap everything into that. And I got involved in way too much, way too fast. I got involved in probably 20 <laughs> ventures. Um, and so and that was really fun. That was my law of 10,000 hours. So long story short, it was I always felt like an entrepreneur when the current world I was in, though, though for fulfilling and lots of ways uh, became less so that was my uh red flag to say i need to get out and go go back to it and you know i, I got a lot of advice from a lot of great people in terms of yeah. do's and don'ts but there's no substitution for the law of ten thousand hours and that's what i put in over the last 10 to 15 years what would so just like give an example of like what were you doing in corporate america near the end where you're just like this is not <laughs> what i want to be doing whether well, like Specific examples of things that start happening in your professional career where you're like this just doesn't jive with the fact that, you know, I like to do things uh, more entrepreneurial. Like I like to sell, I like to go door to door and sell uh, Bibles or what were you selling? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I didn't do that, but I probably would have if somebody presented the opportunity back then. <laughs> uh, it, it just didn't happen. Uh, so I think the biggest catalyst, if I were to look back, was when I was required to get an office in Minneapolis. Uh, and uh, I would have to every other week get up at 5 a.m., squeeze in my workout uh, and uh, fly up to, you know, mini ha ha. Uh, and um, <clears throat> the doors would open in the airport at, you know, 8 a.m. and my nose would freeze and I would go to my office and um, all day long be in all these corporate meetings and People love to hear themselves talk and meetings for the sake <laughs> of that. And uh, it was just, it, it just wasn't me. I, I was trying to conform and learn and grow in that world. But um, I got farther and farther away from my true strength and genius and skills and passions. And so uh, that really wore me down. Uh, and that's when I started to say, this just isn't me. Um, I like to make things happen. I like to build teams. I like to have control and influence over outcomes. Uh, and when there was more and more layers put between me to accomplish that, did not give me the line of sight to matter, make a difference and add value the way I, I had hoped. So all those things came together. But but if you were pick one thing, it was when they said, you need to get an office here and be up here like every other week. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, that's not going to work too well. So a combination of cold weather and, and corporate bureaucracy uh, made you turn the corner. Yeah, I think it's that's well said, Chris. So Peter, I, I understand that motivation. Um, but you've you've worked with thousands and thousands of advisors and you know thousands of advisors and you know people in different business worlds. 
what is it? Is it because certain people, even though they were inconvenienced like you were, would never go out on their own, never take that step. I say you're not an entrepreneur until you have to pay, make a payroll. That's right. Or, or you're not an entrepreneur until you stay up all night figuring out how you're going to make the payroll. That's right. Right. Or make that loan. Is it, is there an entrepreneurial or ownership gene? You know, I think it's um, partly innate, Bob, and partly learned. <clears throat> you know, I think it depends upon your environment that you grew up with, been exposed to. Uh, in combination with kind of what what's your true kind of calling and um, how do you view life? So if you view life, if you're raised uh, to build build characteristics of, of an entrepreneur, self reliance, um, work ethic, um, risk taking, um, if you're raised in that way. Uh, then um, I think you have higher acclamation for it. My best kind of role model of success was my dad, who uh, he started out as an office boy sweeping floors while going to NYU for a firm ah, called Vanity Fair Mills. Yeah, right, in Manhattan. Um, and he, um, you know, he ended up uh, over 45 years becoming the CEO. Uh, and, wow. and he retired from the company, the same company he started off sweeping floors. And, you know, what, what that taught me was two things. One was, you know, man, if you just work hard and do the right things and, um, be kind to pe people and just do the right things to build a career, good things could happen. But, but I watched what he did, you know, every day, his commute to New York. And I said, I don't want to ever work for the man. Um, so like, <laughs> there's no way I would do what my dad did. And then I started out my career, like you guys, as a financial advisor, being an entrepreneur and, you know, and it just kind of moved towards, cause I got turned on by leadership to move towards a management thing. And one day I woke up, it's like, you know, how did I wake up? And I'm, I'm going to Minneapolis twice a month and doing all that. So, so I don't know, Bob, yeah. I think it was, you know, a combination of, I always had this drive to build things mm -hmm. combined with kind of exposure to my dad. And the third frame was I've been a student of leadership my whole life. I mean, I've read every book you can imagine. I've observed. I used to fish in the backyard um, for striped bass for uh, behind the a house of a guy that owned a big company that became a uh, you know gazillion dollar startup in Westport. Uh, and I interviewed him about what <laughs> led to his success. I was, you know, he was on his porch and I'm- How old were you? Uh, I was probably 12, 13. Um, <laughs> and, and so I've always been fascinated by, you know, how do you own this house with a helicopter pad on the ocean, yeah. you know, Westport, Connecticut. So I was like, whoa, you know, I need to find out what's on this. What, what does he think about? And what does he do about what he thinks about? So I better, so all those things together kind of said, dude, you need to build stuff and you need to build teams. And when I was doing that in my past yeah. career, it felt good. But then when I was unleashed, it became a lot more fun. It is, And it is way more yeah. fun right now. Well, I'm curious, what was the best advice he gave you uh, when you interviewed him? You know, what, what did he tell you that really planted the seed of like, you know, how to be successful in your own life? You know, it was the same advice. Uh, that's a great question because it is one of the key things that I've learned in life. Uh, he said almost the exact thing that when I left my corporate career and became an entrepreneur again, uh, what uh, somebody who at that time was a mentor of mine, and it was the same type of advice. So the guy from Connecticut, when I was young, he said something along the lines of, whatever you think your plan is, it's not going to be that way. He, he said, you know, huh. he, he said, you know, and, and, and he, he may have said it or I may have thought it, but I was thinking to myself, you know, man plans and God laughs. Right. Um, <laughs> so I had a girlfriend say that, that to me once. Yeah. Probably more than once for you, Ryan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when I left my career, um, this guy, I was telling me his name is Daryl. Um, he said to me, uh, he said, he goes, look, he goes, your whole life, you've set goals, put a plan in place, help clients do that. Because at this stage of your life, do the opposite. And I said, what's that mean? He goes, look, Peter, pick, you won't really get this until you do it. But put yourself in a raft 
and you're going down a river and there's rocks and you certainly want to get rid of the rocks and navigate that and just keep keep going straight, but you're going to come to all these forks. It goes, your inclination will be to do risk assessment of each fork, you know, all of that. What's the best fork? What's my goal? He said, don't do any of that. Just let the stronger current that goes out to the ocean pull you into that part, not this part. Because when you come to these forks, one part is a part of the stream that's going to go to open water and have a slightly stronger pull. It goes, just go along for the ride, have an open mind, trust the universe that people, connections, opportunities will present themselves. And I got to tell you, the last 15 years for me have been an absolute blast. I've, I've been involved in some really profitable, interesting things, uh, narrowed all those down to two things I do today, as you guys know. Uh, but that advice has led, led me on some uh, adventures that if I had done my usual set goals and plan, would never have done or be a fan exposed to. So, so now, now I'm way more chill about, you know, life and careers. It's like, I just put my time into things where I think I can make a difference um, in the lives of others uh, and therefore myself uh, because it feels great. And I just let the current kind of pull me to the, the right spots. But again, Peter, aren't there, I mean, you, you were willing to take that risk and what you don't perceive as risk, <clears throat> but you know, I know folks who are at 12 years old, if they're speaking to that uh, entrepreneur in Westport, Connecticut, are thinking, I don't want to be like him. I want to work for him one day. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so it's, <clears throat> is there a risk gene that people have? Um, yeah, I think there is, Bob. I and, and, and thanks for asking that again, because I think there is. I think you've got to have something inside of you said that, that, that says that, you know, a few principles. So I'm, I'm really big on being clear on my values, but then trying to learn principles like gravity, where, where if you, you know, if you say, you know what, I'm going to wake up today and I'm not going to respect that principle, that's painful if you decide not to do that. So, you know, one of the mm-hmm. pr- principles of life for me has always been that yeah. life is one big optimization exercise uh, and that everything in life is risk. We walk out the door, you're taking a risk. You you get on the phone, you, you get up from your bed and if your blood pressure drops, you're taking risk. Everything we do in life is a risk. So, so once you demystify risk and say that there's risk everywhere, everything all the way through in life, on this earth anyway, is point A to point B. And if you're trying to optimize life, you're always yeah. constantly evaluating risk. But to me, the risk of staying in a company and working for the man was way higher than the risk of going out on my own and making a bet on myself and the teams that I could. Yeah. So that became, once you, like you all do, you help people understand risk, right? You know, to one person, risk might be if my uh, stocks drop 20%, I'm out of my mind. To others, risk would be, the risk would be not knowing they drop by that and putting more into it. Um, it's the mm-hmm. same risk, the same exact risk, but just perceived in a different way. So I think yeah. a lot of it is how you perceive risk and how you choose to manage risk throughout your life, aligning to those principles. Yeah, well, it's funny. That's that's how we were raised. Actually, Bob always told us you had more risk working for a company than yourself, um, which to your point, it's almost how you view things because in our mind, I think growing up, actually working for somebody else always felt riskier than actually going out on your own. And I don't even, so it's like, Actually, right, in a weird way, right. psychologically, we felt like it's more risk averse to actually work for yourself because you're not relying on other people. So it's, I guess it is only the way that you you view it. And that's funny because like how we grew up, you saw your dad going to the city every day. And you're like, you don't want that. Uh, I think with, with Bob, because you're always really an entrepreneur, we always thought, oh, that's the safe route. <laughs> Which is interesting because you know what, Peter, you and I grew up in a world where, you know, people work for a company, got their pension, got their gold watch and moved on. And that's what they taught their children. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, I think it, it was a mindset that uh, is unique. Yeah, it is. And what's going back to what you asked and kind of the environment, all three of our kids are entrepreneurs. Um, right. And so they did the opposite of what I did, right? In, in a sense, kind of like I did the opposite of what my dad did. Uh, but their, their world is, you know, as they became young adults and now adults, you know, their exposure to my career wasn't 
back in the day when I'm in Italy doing a conference or someplace doing, you know, their, their world is me as the entrepreneur and they see the freedom I have, the joy that I have. Uh, you know, they've observed all of that. They've observed the best of the best of my life as an entrepreneur. So they're like, that looks good. I don't want to work for the man. I want to do that. In fact, so much so that two of the three work for one of my businesses and, and, and they left what they were doing working for the man to join me. So, you know, it is interesting, the exposure. I'm, I'm observing today there's more and more uh, because of the, you know, boomers, so, so, so many have done what I've done uh, to go from corporate to an entrepreneurial life. I think they've seen their parents in that phase, like my kids and more and more kids out of college are getting, you know, business degrees and, 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 and becoming entrepreneurs and perceiving, like we've said, less risk with that than with working for the man. One of our, one of my nephew, one of the boy's cousins is actually majoring in entrepreneurship. And I'm like, I wonder how you teach that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like, uh, go to the school of hard knocks first and then come back and talk yeah, to me yeah. about that, right? <laughs> Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 153, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, and you want a more hands-on approach, Bob, Chris, and I now have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning and investing. This is what we do every single day. We'll put together for you a total financial master plan. We'll do a bird's eye view of your entire financial life and hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. In fact, we'll build you your own personalized financial portal. We'll go through and look at everything you need from an income plan for retirement. How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you take social security? We'll do a full deep dive of your total portfolio. Look at your diversification. Have you had way too much money in the market? Have you seen your portfolio go up and down like a yo-yo or have you been sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do? We'll put together a full investment game plan. We'll show you how to grow your wealth, tie it to your goals, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, insurance product, structured product, brokerage product. We'll do a deep dive of all those investments, show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's now what you make. It's what you take. You'll get a full tax playbook. If you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click on the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. Well, you know, I think, Dad, you make it, Peter, you made a good point. It's like, you know, it, at the time where you're in that moment, you know, you're working for the man, you know, you don't realize that you're, you're, you are taking that risk and that risk is that your destiny is controlled by somebody else. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things I think that, you know, in, in hindsight, you look back on it, you're like, wow, that, uh, that, that's, that's, I really was taking more risk by having somebody else control my life. So I guess it's pretty good that, you know, if someone could go to college and take a class and they could say, look, you know, Go out and start your own thing. I mean, here's the benefits of doing your own thing versus working for somebody else. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of kids out of school. I say kids, but but they're, they're adults, really, you know, that um, seek out advice from folks like all of us. And, um, you know, and, and what I tell them is, you know, do one of two, two things. Work for the man, save a few mil, uh, put some stuff in the bank so you have a background in a cushion and then go out and do it. So that's one way to do it. But but if you can find opportunities to work for yourself and build a team and find a niche where there's a legitimate problem that you can solve, you know, whether you join, you know, a um, smaller company that has a lot of upside where you can participate in equity, um, if you can cut your teeth doing that and find the right environment and team to join, you know, do that. Uh, because you have way more control and way more upside to do it. And what's the worst case? You wake wake up in five years, it didn't work. You can always go back to work for the man. And so that that's kind of what I'm seeing in today's youth. There, there's way more entrepreneurs um, in their 20s today than ever, because our environment was what you said, Bob, right? It's like, you know, you yep. get a college degree, you get your business degree. You know, I, I got mine from um, 
BU School of Management, SMG, which we call School of Money and Greed. Uh, <laughs> so, so you get your degree and then you're like, work for the man and then you build a capital base and then it's like, I'm done. And then you become an entrepreneur. That That's kind of, kind of my generation thought of doing it. I, I don't think it's the same today. We're relieved because Chris thought Gen Z was... Not not useful at all. So you've you've uh, eased his mind. Yeah, I, feel, I feel relieved now. Thank you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but you know the other thing is, once you're successful, to some people you make it look easy, um, and it's not. And uh, you know that famous quote: "Only a paranoid survives." So, what type of paranoia did you have when you were making that transition, Peter? Yeah, there's all sorts of fears that go through our minds and sometimes it's legitimate and sometimes it's uh, false evidence appearing real. Right. So it's, <laughs> yep. um, and I think the key as an entrepreneur is to understand the difference between the two uh, and, and to really, you know, have a constant um, process of urgency. Um, so, you know, all the fears, in fact, we, we were at an event last night and, um, speaking to a guy who just began a um, new company. He was saying that he's up all night long worrying about everything all the time. Uh, and, and, and he asked me the same thing, do you? And it's like, you know, I, I really don't. Um, but but I've got this 24-7 urgency, like to make things happen. But it's not a worry. It was more, you know, the clock started to tick on life. And I'm like, you know, if this isn't going to happen, I need to get off a dead horse and move into something else. And so the art I think of an entrepreneur is to know when the horse is dead and you've got to get off of it <laughs> versus, you know, you're, it, you know, it's darkest before mm. dawn and you're, 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 you're literally a day or week, a month away from turning this thing around. One example would be I was, yeah. uh, was involved. Uh, one of my best friends started a company um, that he proposed on a napkin to me and say, what do you think? <laughs> and I said, don't tell anybody, this is a great idea. And long story short, he launched it. He hired me as his C-suite consultant to do his first two capital raises, uh, to, uh, consult his C-suite team. And, um, he was about a month away from being bankrupt at one point, um, wow. and found a way to pull through it. Um, Fast forward the clock, eight years, he's had three exits. I've been part of all three um, and I got more equity with them and they're gonna have a fourth. Um, and and it's like, that's that point where you have to kind of say, do I push through and lean into it? Or do I go off this horse and get to you know another yeah. one? Do I shoot one and jump jump on another? Why, why didn't you though? I'm, I'm curious in that situation, you're on the brink of bankruptcy, um, you know, how did you have a feeling about that company may have a shot versus this is dead horse? You know, what, can you can you describe a little bit what the difference was and why you continue to believe in that specific company? Yeah, I think it's a what I call an isolation exercise. You have to look at cause and effect and say why why is it a month away from being uh, you know away from it? You know, bad idea is it they just run run out of dough and in my best estimation and it wasn't my call i wasn't the ceo and founder uh but but he came to me and said what would you do and 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 i, and I told him i would do the same thing i know you're going to do and that and that's i would lean into it hard and find a way and and the why is because every other piece lines up except for cash mm -hmm. flow um every other piece market demand, confirmed demand, confirmed relevancy, insanely strong team, extreme, insanely strong CEO, um, and, and great, moment, great momentum in every other way. If they were just having a cash flow crunch. And uh, those are the times you got to find people to write checks or you got to write your, you know, your last one yourself, uh, because that's the time where you really are in a situation where it's darkest before dawn. Peter, you said that uh, when you left uh, your, your corporate job and you went and started the Velarde Group, and you said you, you talk on way too many businesses, you know, of of those businesses, you know, what, what made your most successful one successful? Yeah, so I went from 20 or so, where I had lots of roles, uh, consultant. Uh, what was the worst one? Uh, <laughs> the worst one was a big money raise. Well, worst and best. Uh, the worst one, outcome wise was a money raise for a movie 
that everything lined up and would have been huge, except for distribution, where uh, the company they hired for distribution committed fraud. Not just to oh, us, but, no. but, but 10 other Oof. firms. Um, had it not been for that, this would have been not just a single, this would have been a home run. And it was best in the sense that I met some of the greatest people from doing that. Uh, the worst in that everybody lost everything. Um, and about a year or two of time, we raised um, uh, over a hundred million to fund a movie, Grassroots, um, and it got made. It got produced on four thousand screens for distribution. But what we thought they did. So what what I learned about that is that it's 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 not ever what you know that goes wrong. It's the things you just don't know. You can't foresee. You know. You can't project. Um, so that, that's what I learned from that one. What I learned goes right is my influence. So what I learned was I don't want to be involved in anything that I can't personally, you know, invest in Impact. influence yeah. and play a role. And, and I, I learned that, you know, the law of 10,000 hours, you know, you learn a lot, you learn what to do, what not to do. You learn trends and themes to why things work, why things don't work. I don't write a check to invest in private equity anymore unless I feel like I have some influence on it. Board seat, advisor, um, operating role, because I just know that that I now uh, know enough to be dangerous to make the call whether to get off the horse. And failure is a part of all of it. Uh, you can't succeed without failing. Um, it's just an issue you want to minimize those and optimize the others. And, and like I said, it's the art of, do I shoot the horse or do I get on a new new one or do I ride it harder? You just have to, you have to have enough experience, which there's no substitution for to be able to make that call. Well, you know, and that situation where, you know, that distribution company committed fraud, I mean, that, that must've felt pretty devastating. I mean, how did you, how did you overcome that? Yeah, it was Chris. Um, and it was just emotional competence, right? It was just you, saying, hey, that's just an event. Um, and I have a choice how I respond to that event. Here's my choice set. And my choice set was to say, hey, you know, there was some good that came out of it, provided a great tax deduction. Um, <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> and met some great people, learned a ton about what could go wrong. Uh, I can parlay that knowledge into something else that's meaningful. And you, you, you say the word that I've always taught people for you know, the last 40 plus years to say, and the word is next. You just move on uh, and you release that and you move on to something else. It kind of fits into this philosophy, which is very clear about your, oh, I love is, uh, you know, life is an exercise in optimization. I mean, that's a great line. It, I think it exemplifies you, <laughs> like, oh, you. I, you know, for as long as I've known you. And I think it also plays into, you know, you've built this entrepreneurial life for yourself. Like you said, your kids now really admire the way you have the freedom, but it also seems like you're not just optimizing for the financial aspect. Ever since I've known you, it, it's really this balance between your health. Um, you're always on to like what's new uh, and innovative when it comes to nutrition. I know you, you work out like a madman. You're probably one of the healthiest guys I know. Um, can you talk a little about that, just your overall philosophy of optimization, especially on the health side as well? Because I know it's a big part of how you've kind of built this, this life and ecosystem uh, around yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and again, for me, it kind of comes down to principles and thanks for, for saying all those nice things. Um, you know, to me, it's not just about optimizing one part of your life. It's about optimizing all parts of your life. Right. So for me, it's my, my business life, it's health, it's my relationships. It's like, you know, Jenny and I have now been together 40 years, uh, married wow. 34 as of Sunday, you know, so that's not 47 today. He's got you beat. Uh, yeah. Thank Congratulations, Bob. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. So that's kind of principle one. Principle two would probably be that I'm always seeking balance. Uh, I'm a big fan of, and I've seen this over years and years. I'm a big fan of kind of yin and yang and that at any point in your life, having the right mix of chaos and order, um, you know, so that's working out versus rest. It's saving versus spending, giving versus saving. Um, you know, I've, I've had people try to convince me that that's called the mushy middle um, and that you should live <laughs> on the sides of, of risk and, and safety. And 
I never bought that. Uh, I never bought that at all. I've, I've always known that both are necessary. You know, my mom used to say all the time, you know, eat in moderation, do everything in moderation. Uh, and it's true. It, it's very true. So, so that plays into the optimization because you can't go, go, go and not recharge, right? It's why great entrepreneurs self-impose structure. Mm -hmm. And that means you've got the right time to gain time, you know, focus time. You've got, you know, time to prepare for that game time. And then you have free time. You need time to recharge. Yeah. Um, so part of the way I view life is that I'm always, you know, I can tell when I'm out of control and I need a little more order. And I can tell times when things are kind of boring and uh, I'm feeling comfortable, which is like, to me, the, 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 the fifth sin of the world. Um, <laughs> so it's like comfortable. Why would I want to be comfortable? You know, I want to grow. Up. It doesn't sound mod like moderation to me. I don't think it's moderation. <laughs> oh, at all. I do. I, mean, it's like you're doing I, I do. No, but, it, but it's, you're doing everything intensely, but you're also taking like need a rest in between. I, I wouldn't say that's, that's a, that's a moderate man. But anyway. Yeah, but but think of it this way: intense I, moderation, right? Come yeah, on. like like I yeah. I rest intensely. Intense yeah. moderation. Like yeah. if you see me at the a... lake house on a um, Sunday, um, on my top deck of my dock, um, I mean I rest hard. I mean I really do. Um, I take naps. <laughs> um, I watch my golf on TV and watch the ball go like this for three hours. Um, I mean I I love, and that's my growth opportunity, Ryan. Because you're right, like because I I can be very very intense. So you know, for me, it's making sure I have the order to offset that. So it is about optimization. It is about um, trying to find that balance at all times. And then for health, you know, for health for me, it's all about when I say optimize health. It's all you know to me. It's about health span, not lifespan. It's not I want to live to a hundred and then. Yeah fall apart in the last phase of it. I want to live healthy as long as we can. Can you, can you walk us through your schedule? Like just describe like, how do you balance those things out through the week and the day? Like what is your, what's your typical schedule look like? Cause I'm curious, like, yeah. How, how do you approach the day to make these things happen? Just make it more tangible. Yeah, for sure. So uh, three pillars, I guess, to pay attention to uh, sleep, exercise, diet. Uh, if you don't get those three right, you're not even in the game, right? Um, and so, and, okay. and, and there's a lot I could say about all of those. Yeah. Here's my day. So, uh, and I'll, yeah, I'll just use one here. Right. So, try to get in bed by 10, um, successful mo mo most nights. Uh, I'm up by six. Um, what do I do? The first thing I do is uh, some form of red light. So, we've got a red light pen panel that, um, helps with inflammation, cellular repair. I do that for uh, a half an hour. Um, what do you do? You stand in front of them. Is there a... Yep. You do front and back. Uh, yep. So Bob okay. for your back or, you know, whatever you're, you're going through, red light therapy is fantastic. Um, so so I'll do red light about three times a week for the first thing. I did it today. Uh, during red light or after, I'll do 10 minutes of meditation. I've got three forms that I do of that. Um, includes breathing. It includes gratitude. It includes focus for the day. Um, I'll, I'll do that. Um, if the sun is out, I'll try to get at least 15 minutes of sun. Uh, and when I do the sun, I do something called a gasku, uh, which is okay. a set of stretching and movement that kind of just jump starts your day. I'll, I'll do all that. All that takes maybe the first hour of my day. Uh, then I'll do my first wow. cup of coffee. Uh, and then I'm at my desk by 7.30ish, um, starting work. And then throughout the day, I will do what I call exercise snacks. So I'll get up from this podcast and I will go do something that means movement. Like example would be uh, run in place for three minutes or go. We have this um, jumping thing. I forgot what it's called, um, that, that, that you jump to like drain your lymph nodes. Uh, so. You know that I I fast three days a week, so I won't eat anything till like noon, three days a week. Um, I will do what's called carb cycling. Uh, I do soft supplements. We do cold plunge and sauna probably three days a week, and so that's kind of the routine. Wow. And I'll work out five days a week, uh, two days cardio, uh, three days weights, and I'll do one rest day a week. 
So Peter, on the fasting days, are you just skipping breakfast at that point or are you reducing all your other meals as well? Um, both Chris. So, uh, one, one of the three days is kind of, I'll eat right. Like, uh, my first meal, 10, 30, 11, but cut back and do calorie restriction in the day. Uh, and then, uh, the other two days, I just won't eat anything until about noon. Right. And that's kind of what, what, what we do and in there. I fit in work. Uh, we fit in social, we fit in all the things that we all do in our life, but, uh, these have become habits. Uh, that's the most important thing I've learned is you can say whatever you want, but in, until you, and I've got note cards that I, uh, wake, wake up that has all the things I told you on a note card. So I'm like, uh, you know, a robot, I get up and basically I just do them. Um, and I enjoy them and I try to lean into them to get the most out of them. So it's just not a routine. Yep. And then I'll mix things up. I'll, I'll listen to a podcast like this and somebody will say, you know, this is what I do. And I'll say that that's pretty cool. I don't do that. I should do that. And I'll cross one thing off I'm doing and add that to my list. I think, I think we got the title of your book, relaxing intently, intensely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I love to relax. I love to chill. I love to rest, but, but you, but I, I, I do it and I don't know if you guys have found this, but um, Bob, I'm sure you have. The older we get, the more, you know, your body tells you what to do. It's like if yeah. I wake up and I just feel burnt out in a day, you know, that tells me, dude, you know, rest today. Just, you know, go for a walk. Right. You know, we walk almost every day. Um, you know, the days that I'm just tired, um, I'll just go for a walk, but I won't do I won't hit the gym. But, you know, Peter, you don't have you don't have my wife, Denise, who sets our social calendar. There's no such thing as rest in this household. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it sounds like we've got uh, wives that are kind of cut from the same mold, Bob. <laughs> I don't know if Janine's uh, if I've ever seen her take a nap in the afternoon. Let's put it that way. No, it doesn't happen here. <laughs> so one question to wrap things up that we ask all our guests is if you can think of one song or album that you heard it, for the first time, it changed your entire view of the world. Uh, what is it and when was it? There's a lot, but <clears throat> I would say Journey, uh, the song Don't Stop Believing. Uh, hey, great. When I, when I heard that back as a teen, teen I'm like, you know, and, and if, again, you hear something and you interpret it through your own lens, right? But, you know, to me, it was like, don't stop, uh, don't stop dreaming. Don't stop uh, seeing the future. You know, I've always had this innate thing. I've always had these, um, movies in my brain, um, saying this is how your life is going to unfold, you know, do it right kind of thing. And so, you know, for me, whether you call it God, whether you call it, uh, a dream, it's, it's, there's, there's been this pull for me yeah. that has said, you know, go out and make a difference and, um, don't stop, you know, your belief that you can prepare yourself for that to happen. And um, the last thing I'll, I'll say, because I, I think I told you the story, Ryan, uh, but but as you recall, I'm not really supposed to be here because when I was uh, about one and we were in Columbus, Ohio, uh, there was a flight we were supposed to take to New York for Christmas. Um, and very last second, my dad just decided to drive instead. And it, it was a very spontaneous thing. And long story short, that flight, along with another flight, had a midair collision and, and everybody died on both flights. Wow. Um, and uh, I didn't really hear that story or understand it until I was a teen. And then as I'm studying yeah. all these successful people, my dad's sharing the story. I'm like, how come I didn't get this? You know, when I was a kid, it's like, you know what? I, it's like I'm on borrowed time. So how, how grateful am I? that to me, every day is a great day when I wake up, it doesn't matter. And so, and with, yeah. and with that, to me, comes like this obligation. I'm like, you know, I feel, you know, morally obligated to do something with this life to help others make a difference matter. Um, and it's always been in me. So that song kind of led to me saying, you know, believe in that, you know, acknowledge it. Uh, don't, discountant don't make more of it than it is or, or less of it than it is and so that that would be my answer to that incredible incredible did you ever ask your dad what the reason was why he decided not to go take his family on that flight you know i have because uh before my dad passed away six years ago 
Uh, about five years prior to that, uh, we played in a golf event and every time I would take him to lunch and interview him and ask him things like that. Uh, and a lot of that I built into his eulogy. Uh, but when I asked him that, he said two things. One, he said, well, first of all, we had too many gifts that year to bring in the plane. We started to load them in the car. Well, like we can hardly yeah. get them in the car to go to the airport, which is when he decided not to go. He goes, how are we going to get these on the plane? You know, and we, were, and we were young. I was less than a year old at that point. Um, that, that was one. And he said, but the other one was way more powerful. The other thing he said was, I just had this gut feel that's what we should do. Uh, wow. And, you know, incredible. I, I get chills just saying that, right? It's like, it's like, you know, again, is that God, the universe? You know, you think about your own beliefs. But, uh, you know, to me, it's a voice. And, and, and he, he listened. You know, what if he didn't listen? What, what, you know, what if my dad was a point in his life where he wasn't evolved enough to, to hear that and do something about that, you know? So I thought that was interesting. Well, it almost goes back to that entrepreneur that lived near you when you're younger saying, just go with the flow, right. go with what, where the pool is. I don't know. It's kind of uh, in the same vein. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So thanks for having me on today. This has been really fun. And Thanks, Peter. We appreciate you, man. And we're, uh, we're inspired by your, uh, your lust for life is a way to put it. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at BeBullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Payne Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. 